When I first learned Lagrangian mechanics, I liked it, but I wanted to understand better how it related to the mechanics I knew and loved, Newton's laws. Teaching the subject years later, I realized that the books just don't do a good job of this. So, I'm going to do it myself. This video is Lagrangian mechanics derived. Anytime anyone says derived, you should ask that person, from what? You have to start somewhere. And in this video, I'm going to start from the very beginning. Force equals mass times acceleration. So I have n particles, could be 2, could be 10,000, for a total of 3n Cartesian positions. And all I'm going to assume is that somebody has told me the forces. The force acting on the ike particle denoted F sub capital I. Now, Lagrangian mechanics emerges when you start thinking about other ways you might specify the system. Maybe instead of giving all of the Cartesian positions, you want to give the spherical coordinate positions. Or maybe you want to give some other kind of coordinate, like the angle between two bars in your system. In general, any set of numbers, q1 through q little n, from which you can reconstruct the original Cartesian positions, i.e. the state of the system, is called a generalized coordinate system. And while it can be simplest to think about the case where little n equals 3 times capital N, so that you have the same number of coordinates, the power of this formalism actually comes from the fact that you don't need to. And all of the mathematics in this video will apply to those cases. The only thing we require is that we can always get r sub i from these q sub i. So we need some mathematical implications of this assumption that we can smoothly reconstruct the system from the little q. From the chain rule, taking a total time derivative, we get a relationship between r dot sub i and q dot sub i. We can regard r dot sub i as a function of q and q dot, and then we have partial derivatives defined, and there's some simple relationships you can check on the bottom of the screen. We get to Lagrangian mechanics by expressing Newton's law in terms of the generalized coordinates. But the trick is, we don't just plug in for generalized coordinates. That would be correct, but it won't be the most efficient. The nicest thing to do is to realize that this is a vector equation. And when you change a vector to new coordinates, you multiply by a Jacobian matrix, or a change of basis matrix. Here, we don't want to think of it as n three-dimensional vectors. We want to think of it as one big 3n dimensional vector. And the Jacobian matrix we need is the matrix of partial derivatives, which we again think of as a 3n by little n matrix. So to change the basis of this equation, we matrix multiply, which means we sum over capital I and we take the dot product so that we're doing a big matrix multiplication involving all 3n coordinates. OK, let's compute. We start with the left-hand side, where we have m r double dot times dr dq. In the first line here, all I've done is I've used the product rule for derivatives to write things in a suggestive way. Now, in the second line, I use those two formulas from the last page. Finally, in the third line, I notice that there's an awful lot of r dot dot r dot appearing, and so I use the product rule again to rewrite it in terms of a half m r dot squared. But what is that? That's just the kinetic energy. If we move the sum over i inside the equation, the left-hand side has reduced to the very nice expression total time derivative of d kinetic energy dq dot minus dt dq. What about the right-hand side? Well, there's not too much we can really do to that. We just give it a name. We say when we dot f into dr dq and sum over capital I, that is the generalized force q sub little i associated with the ike coordinate. Put it all together, and you get this very nice equation. It's starting to look a little like Lagrangian mechanics, but on the right-hand side, we have this thing q. What do we do with that? Well, here's where the real magic happens. There's a lot of forces in your system. F sub i. You might think you have to include every single one, like you do in Newtonian mechanics. But in Lagrangian mechanics, there are some forces you don't have to include. An example is the normal force. 
Here's the classic problem of a block sliding down a ramp. There's gravity pulling down on the block, but it doesn't go straight down because there's a force normal to the surface that keeps it on the surface. Now in Newtonian mechanics, you have to include this force. But look what happens in Lagrangian mechanics. If we have capital R of Q taken to be x equals Q, y equals 0, and z equals Q tan theta, as shown here, then no matter what Q I choose, that block is always sitting on the incline. So by using the single coordinate Q, I have enforced the constraint that that block is on the incline. Now when I compute this thing dr dq, it's tangent to the incline. You can see that mathematically, or you can just think, what does dr dq mean? It means how does r change when we vary q, and by construction, r can only change along the incline, so that vector dr dq is along the incline. In particular, it's orthogonal to the normal force, and so when we commute this generalized force q, the dot product is 0, and q equals 0 for that force. There are other forces like this. Tension is the most common one. Tension always comes in force pairs, and in Newtonian mechanics, the tension is directed on different points and in other directions, but it's always directed along the rope. And so if you choose a generalized coordinate such that the rope has fixed length, you will always find that in this sum, over all the particles where we dot the force with the displacement, dr dq, they will always cancel out. You can always ignore normal forces. You can always ignore tension. There are some other ones you could ignore too, which are a little more subtle. One of them is rolling motion in one dimension, but not in two or higher dimensions. We'll talk a bit more about that at the end of the video. So, constraint forces don't contribute if you can find coordinates to enforce those constraints for you. Another kind of force that plays very nicely with Lagrangian mechanics is a conservative force, one that comes from a potential. And you can see from the equation on the lower left that by the chain rule, if the Newtonian force came from a potential, then so does the generalized force. Q sub i is just minus partial u, partial qi. In mechanical systems, the most common conservative forces are gravity and spring forces, but there could be others. So now we're ready to put it all together. If we have chosen coordinates such that all the constraints are enforced, and if the only other con forces are conservative forces, where coming from a potential u equals u of q, then we can take the equation that always holds on the upper right, plug in q equals minus di dq, and now we get an equation that is starting to look an awful lot like the Euler-Lagrange equation. In fact, it is the Euler-Lagrange equation. If you take L equals T minus U, then the right two terms are just DL dQ. And the left term is also D by DT DL dQ dot because DU dQ dot is zero. So we've derived the Euler-Lagrange equation for the Lagrangian T minus U, and we know that the system extremizes the action. S is integral of T minus U dT. In summary, here's the relationship between Lagrangian mechanics and Newtonian mechanics. If in your Newtonian mechanics description, every force you need either comes from a potential, like gravity or springs, or can be completely eliminated by choosing a generalized coordinate, then your system has a Lagrangian L equals T minus U. Now, what about if your forces can't be eliminated by generalized coordinate, and when does that happen? That's a more advanced topic called non-holonomic constraints, which I plan to do a video on in future. That's all for today. Thanks for tuning in.